Is it recording now? That's recording. I got to plug it off. Didn't know whether we would have a Bible study today or not, but we've got people here, so let's let's uh, let's have a Bible study. And again, what a better thing to be discussing right now than the the the, the healing ministry of Jesus. Uh, so we're going to go with that. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we ask you and we pray, Lord God, in these difficult and extraordinary times. Even sitting here, we're not even certain uh, when our next meeting will be here, Lord, because we're simply uh, going one day at a time, Father. But we pray, Lord God, that you just continue to raise your church up to be the church, Lord. Cause us to walk in the, the gospel. Cause us to walk in the power of the kingdom, Lord. Cause us to, to just, Lord, Hear your voice, see your face, be strengthened and empowered for your work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All, all over the world, we're hearing uh, you know, the coronavirus situation, but we're hearing the churches in so many different places are just rising up and continuing to do the work of the kingdom, continuing to walk in the power of the gospel. I mean, at this time, it's just, we just keep praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So, and we're praying for each other. And this is an hour where we just want to see the church becoming the church in this hour. Hallelujah. So, I may digress. We don't know. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on here. We want to just uh, continue to talk about Jesus' healing ministry. And I think I want to go back to uh, Mark at this point, and the first place I want to go to is Mark chapter 5. We're going to pick up in the 21st verse. We, we looked at this uh, story in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but we're going to look at it uh, in an isolated sense in Mark so that we can uh, deal with it uh, a little more. Uh, if, if we take a look here, Mark 5.21 reads, Now when Jesus had crossed over by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, she may be healed, and she necessarily goes to them. They just come to him, and they come his way. So he's on his way to heal this little girl. And again, you know, thinking so much about, about uh, the situation we're in and the fact that we, we, we are very careful not to touch each other. Uh, we're careful about... Uh, staying at a distance from each other. We're careful about quarantine. And, and as I'll share in, the, in the, the main message, the Sunday message, uh, quarantine is, is biblical. I mean, you know, the Jews, they, they, they quarantined people when they had certain communicable illnesses. Um, one of the things we, uh, I, I sent out a, um, a video uh, uh, on YouTube that, um, Reggie Holiday had 
had sent us the Master Builders Pastors, and it's called Biblical Quarantine. If you can go on YouTube and just look up Biblical Quarantine, it's uh, from a brother from South America who is both an MD and an apostle, and he just he shares a 25-minute teaching on why quarantine is God's will. And it's, he's pointing out that the Jews understood things about cleanness and uncleanness. They understood things about quarantine. And he was pointing out that when the, the Black Plague hit Europe in the 14th century, and one third of the population uh, of Europe died, the Jews did because they instantly went into quarantine. They understood quarantine from the Bible. The Jews were spared much of the death because of quarantine. So contrary to some of the things we're hearing, on one hand, we don't want to be fearful. Of course, we're not, we don't want to be fearful. But to think that quarantine is being fearful, quarantine is, is using wisdom. Quarantine is, 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 is taking biblical caution. So one of the things, though, in spite of that, and this is the thing when you follow Jesus, you know, you're going to say one thing, and the next minute you're going to, it sounds like you're going to contradict what you just said. Um, and that's the way scripture works. The Lord put the quarantine laws in the Bible because they're righteous laws. But then Jesus touched everybody he wasn't supposed to touch, which is a contradiction of the quarantine laws. But this is Jesus. We have to understand Jesus follows not any kind of rules. He's the maker of the rules. Amen. So Jesus uh, can, can, can really do what he wants. And one of the things about Jesus is healing miracles, and he didn't always uh, touch people to heal them. He didn't have to touch people to heal them. Remember the centurion servant, he just says, well, look, take me to your house. You know, I'll, I'll go lay hands on your servant who's dying. No, Lord, you don't need to do it. Just speak the word. See, Jesus can heal from a distance, too. He can heal from a distance. I know that my um, uh, ex-son-in-law, who is quarantined for a uh, but for legal reasons and legal purposes, is praying for healing for people all the time that he's not touching or laying hands on. He's praying for them at a distance and they're being healed. So, so, so we're okay with, with, with whatever way the Lord chooses to use us and show us. We can pray uh, and we don't have to stop praying. But Jesus is constantly breaking uh, laws by touching, even now, a, a person who was dead or a person who had illness, uh, a significant illness in the, the Jews, among the Jews, you weren't supposed to touch them. And again, they weren't just for spiritual reasons of cleansing, being spiritually clean. They, were, they also had to do with health issues. But it's, it's interesting, immediately when this request is made to Jesus, Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. Jesus is going to touch the dead. Jesus is going to touch the lepers. Jesus is going to touch uh, those who have a, an issue of blood, because he's Jesus. Now, remember the, the verse that we looked at in Matthew. This is the verse I quoted last week. when I, I, I didn't come last week, and, and again, I quarantined myself to kind of set a, a um, just a, a model for the church. I wasn't feeling well. I, I, had different, uh, I had different symptoms of illness. It wasn't that I didn't come to church because I was worried about myself. I didn't come to church because I didn't want to get anyone else sick. Quarantine is an act of love, too. It can be an act of love toward others saying, you know, I'm, I'm showing some symptoms here. I'm, I'm, I don't want to get anybody else ill. So, so the, there, there is a lot of uh, imagery here behind this, but I quoted two verses. And I said, I don't have the coronavirus, brethren, but here, here's, here's what I'm seeing taking place. And I want you to see the ministry of Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Now, I've, I've referred to this verse on several occasions in the Bible study in the exhortation last week. And what I, what I want you to see here is 
what Matthew is saying. This is the verse that the church often uses to say there is healing in the atonement. And as I have said before, I'm not saying there's not healing in the atonement. There's all kinds of healing in the atonement. We're, we're, we're healed from our, our sin. Our sins are forgiven and we're cleansed from our sin. Uh, there can be physical healing in the atonement. There can be, there can be uh, deliverance from, from evil powers. But that's not what Matthew is saying here in this verse. He's in, Jesus is in the midst of, of performing uh, certain healings. He's cleansed a leper at the start of chapter 8. He's cleansed the centurion's servant. He's, he's healed that centurion servant, the passage we just spoke of. At verse 14, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And we'll just kind of dive in at verse 14 of Matthew 8. Now when Jesus had, Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her hand and the fever left her, and she arose and served them. She was, she was a servant. That was her nature, but she's sick and she can't serve others. Jesus heals her, and immediately she begins serving others. Beautiful picture of both Jesus' healing power and, and this, this servant of God being restored by Jesus immediately returning to what God had called her to do. It says, when the evening had come, they brought to him many who were uh, oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. And then the, here's where the verse from Isaiah 53 is quoted. So that it might be fulfilled. In other words, Jesus' healing ministry and his deliverance ministry is fulfilled in this scripture. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now that's that's Isaiah 53. Now we know Isaiah 53 is speaking about the suffering servant. And it's it's really it's a passage about the fact that that suffering servant will make atonement for the sin of God's people. But this verse doesn't necessarily say the way Matthew's using it here. doesn't say that healing is in, in the atonement. It says that healing is in Jesus. And the reason Jesus touched people, people who weren't supposed to be touched under Jewish law, people who were were, were not only wracked with sickness, but, but uh, oppressed with demon powers. Jesus is literally, when he's dealing with them and praying for their healing and deliverance, is taking their sickness and their oppression into himself. He's taking it into himself, and he's breaking the power in himself. So we, we need to be careful about what we teach and, and, and how we understand scripture. Is healing in the atonement? Certainly healing is a byproduct of the atonement. But the scripture is saying healing's in Jesus. It's in Christ. It's in his person. And the same Jesus that walked among the crowds, touched them, spoke words to them, broke demon power, healed the sick, that same Jesus is a lot seated at the right hand of the Father, and healing is in him. Now, it, what it says is that what the implication that I'm getting here, and I'll, I'll, I'll tie it into the passage in, in, in Mark where Jesus calls his 12 disciples, is that when we as Christians fight with illness, this is what I was saying last week, I said, I'm fighting with illness here. I go and I believe I'm fighting with illness for the whole church. I'm fighting for, with illness for individual people. Uh, in the body of Christ that need to be healed. I'm fighting for illness for people that I'm praying for from a distance on my prayer list. Part of the ministry of Jesus is that we war with these things for others. So in this hour, particularly when we're, we're ultra sensitive to illness, I mean, I, I, I didn't have the coronavirus uh, uh, last week when I, when, I, when I missed some events, but I, I had something. But I was conscious in fighting my own illness, that I was also, like Jesus, making war with all illness, making war with the illness for all the members in this congregation, making 
uh, war with the illness for the people in my family, making war with the illness for people that we're, we're praying from, that we hear about through prayer requests, we hear about through others. And I, I really want us to see that and understand it, that that's part of, 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 of an apostolic function where you begin to recognize that what is taking place in your life has greater implications than just for your life. And that's why I went from Matthew 8 and I quoted this verse just to show it at work in, in Paul's life, a verse I quote oftentimes and I call it the apostolic imperative, and that's in Colossians chapter 1. Now remember, when Paul is writing Colossians 1, Paul is in prison. It's one of the so-called prison epistles. It's, it's, some of the, uh, it's part of the final epistles in Paul's life. Paul was, uh, when, when he appealed to Caesar, and they sent him to Rome, he was under house arrest, at least from what we can tell in Scripture, uh, where the New Testament ends. The, the New Testament ends in, in Acts chapter, uh, in Acts, the, the, the final chapter of Acts, uh, and it, it ends with Paul being under house arrest. Well, that's, that's the prison situation that he was in when he wrote Colossians and Ephesians. Now, there's a tradition in the church, and tradition is a little different from Scripture. Scripture, we, 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 we know the church has said this is the absolute word of God. We believe it. We don't have to speculate if it's right or correct or true. But church tradition is, is sometimes it includes different stories uh, that circulated through the early church. Now, there is a story that Paul actually got out of prison uh, uh, between writing, you know, uh, uh, Colossians and, and Ephesians and, and, and Philippians those so-called prison epistles. He got out of prison, did an unnamed uh, missionary trip, and then came back and was put in prison again and was martyred. Well, that may or may not be true. That's just simply speculation. I'm just going to go by what we have in the New Testament, that when Paul was writing Colossians, this was it for Paul. I mean, he never got out of prison. He never got out from under house arrest. That's in Acts 28, of course, but Paul says this, and see, here's the thing about an apostolic perspective. An apostolic perspective really understands the solidarity that we have with each other in the body of Christ. An apostolic perspective is far different from American Christianity. American Christianity emphasizes individualism. Uh, many, many versions of Christianity are affected by human culture, and, and human culture has broken free, at least in, in our Western culture, uh, from this idea of community solidarity. But if you were a, a, a Jew, if you were a Christian in the early church, if you're Paul, that's why Paul had such an emphasis in his writings on the body of Christ. Paul really is the, is the, the one who who lays out for us our, our whole theology of the body of Christ, the oneness of, of, of the body of Christ, the solidarity of the body of Christ. But it's an apostolic perspective to, to recognize this kind of premise. Everything I go through is not simply for me. It is for me, but it's for everybody else as well. And as we begin to see as, as we begin to see, as we begin to interpret, as we begin to think apostolically, we, we begin to recognize that what we go through is for everyone else. Now this would go along with what I was saying in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus taking the illness into himself and fighting it for everyone else. Paul says the same thing. Paul is saying, in verse 24 of Colossians 1, I now rejoice in my sufferings. He's in prison. He's suffering. His, his freedoms have been taken away. And, and he is going to ultimately be uh, a martyr because of this. It was while he was in prison that they end up uh, uh, putting him to death. 
But notice, he, so he's suffering. He understands he's suffering, but he says, I rejoice in my suffering for you. I rejoice in my suffering on your behalf, is literally what it says. God bless you, Paul. Amen. And God bless Jesus, God bless Paul, and may God bless us to begin to see this, to begin to see and begin to understand. That's why even something as simple as, as, as saying, I'm staying home, uh, I'm going to quarantine myself because I don't want to get someone else sick. That is an apostolic perspective. And see, one of the things, when, when we look and we say, okay, I don't really know what's going on right now. I don't really understand why all of this is happening. Sure, I, I mean, I, I could give you all kinds of reasons, but I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to come to grips. I'm still trying to come to grips with understanding what is taking place in this worldwide pandemic. But I'm going to I'm going to offer a, a couple of suggestions. The, the Lord is is getting the world's attention, and in getting the world's attention, He's getting the church's attention. What He wants the church to be is He wants the church to become the church, and and one of the ways that the church can become the church is that we start thinking beyond how is what I'm going through affecting. Or how is what I'm going through affecting maybe my immediate family? I mean, we we individualism really in in, a, in America has gone beyond just me. It's me and mine, me and my family. But you and your family is still individual. It's 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 thinking of things in one way. I can imagine we're going to be not only having to deal with quarantine, caring about others, with recognizing that the health issues we struggle with are for others. How about recognizing the, the financial issues we're going to go through as being for others? Xavier? So I was reading uh, Matthew 8 and 9 uh, the other day. And uh, in Matthew 9, he's uh, talking to the paralytic. Mm -hmm. uh, says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees and scribes are saying, it's blasphemy. Right. What I got from it was he forgave the man before he healed him. Amen. I really believe like this coronavirus is bringing more people to repentance. Amen. Than, than death. Amen. Uh, bringing more people to repentance, bringing forgiveness into people's lives, and then healing people because they're forgiven. Which is which is. What, what Xavier is saying is, is what we're saying. God is doing a lot of things right now in this hour to really um, bring us to, to a different perspective. Are, are we going to be hoarders or are we going to share what God gives us? There's, there, there, there are a lot of things here that we could, uh, a lot of things we could talk about. I'm certain the Holy Spirit is going to be uh, causing us to think about these things uh, just in, in our, our uh, uh, our, our upcoming days uh, of our lives in this season. But Paul says, I rejoice in my suffering for you. It's his suffering, but he sees it's for them. And then he says, I fill up in my flesh. There's As, as I gain the victory here, as I press into God's grace, as I press into God's healing, as I press into God's word, I'm filling something up in my own human body and my own personal individual experience I'm filling something up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ he's saying that that I see that in the body of Christ there's a lack the church doesn't know how to suffer the church doesn't know why it's suffering the church doesn't have answers for situations the church may need physical the church may need the breaking of demon power. There's a lack in my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ with whom I am in solidarity and what I am going through is being seen through the prism and the lens of what can I do for my brothers and sisters in Christ? What can I do for my family? 
What, what, what can I do for my neighbors? What can I do for the, the backsliders I know? What can I do for the, the people that are in my life but that don't know Jesus? Paul is saying, I'm filling up in my flesh what is lacking of the afflictions of Christ. And what were the afflictions of Christ? He bore our infirmities. He took our sickness upon himself. He took illness. He took demon oppression on himself. Those were the afflictions of Christ. That was the trials and the suffering and the affliction Jesus suffered. Remember, every one of us are completely different from Jesus Christ. We suffer because we're human beings. We suffer as a consequence of our sin. We suffer because of our Errors. We suffer because of our unbelief. We suffer for things, and it's just, we deserve it. I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's part of our lot in life. But Jesus is the, the only human being, God and man, but he was a man. He's the only human being that he didn't suffer for any reason that was his fault. He was without sin. So what the afflictions of Christ have to do with which is that Christ are the things that Jesus took on himself for others. Their suffering, their pain, their sickness, their oppression. Jesus took it on himself and released healing. So when Paul says, I'm suffering in my body to fill up in my flesh what's lacking of the afflictions of Christ, he's saying, as an apostolic servant of Jesus, I'm letting Jesus in Matthew 8 there be my model. I'm letting the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 be my model of what it means to take things into myself, to take things on myself for the sake of the body of Christ. I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body which is the church. So we're, we're trying to give a picture here. Jesus had a healing ministry. He still has a healing ministry. Healing is in Jesus. It's not in me. It's not in a gift that I possess. I don't have a healing gift in my back pocket. It's not in the apostolic ministry. It's in Jesus. And we always have to remember that. But we having faith in Christ, can enter in the solidarity with him and become part of his body. And so because he has that healing ministry, we have that healing ministry. So exercising the healing ministry is like going into the treasure room with Jesus. Jesus is the treasure. He's the pearl of great price. He's, he's the treasure we find hidden in a field, and, and we give everything we have to purchase it. He's that treasure, but we go into the treasure chest and there's access to healing in Jesus. Always remember that. When you're praying for people, when you're praying for yourself, when you're doing spiritual work or whatever, when you're evangelizing, the treasure is in Jesus and we have access to Jesus because we are in solidarity with him. We are part of his body. And Paul continues, I do this for the sake of his body, which is the church, of which body of Christ the church I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God so Paul has this stewardship stewardship remember is taking care of the possessions and goods that belong to another See, this is what's beautiful about it. healing belongs to Jesus we're just stewards of his healing Healing is in Christ, but we have access to it because in apostolic ministry, he's given us, he's given us access to that. And then he says, he says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which is given to me for you. See, it's always for you. I suffer for you. I, I have access to the healing power of Jesus for you. I have access to the gospel for you. I have access to the revelation of Jesus for you. It's always for somebody else, which was given to me for you 
to fulfill the word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. It's a revelation that the word gives to the saints, the, the people of God, the holy ones of God, something they didn't see before. To them, it was God's will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in your midst, Jesus in our midst, the hope of glory. All of this is to give us hope. What I'm teaching today is to give us hope. You understand hope and faith are different. I've, I've talked about that before. If you don't have faith, have hope. All right? I, I, I'm really struggling with my faith. Well, that's okay. Have hope. I'm really struggling with my love right now. Well, that's okay. Have hope. It's at the beginning of actually Colossians here. It's at the beginning of this chapter. Go back. Go back a, a, a few verses up to the, the beginning of Colossians where Paul says in verse 2 of Colossians 1, he says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith, in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. We have faith in Christ. We have love for the saints. And then it says, the next verse says, which are because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Hope, that's where the faith in Jesus Christ and the love for the saints, it comes from hope. And hope, it's a hope laid up for us in heaven of which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. You know what hope is? This is what hope is. Hope is everything that Jesus said in the gospels. I expect that to be true. Everything that Jesus promised in the gospel, I expect that he will do in his time. Hope is just looking at everything that Jesus said in the gospel and living as if it's true expecting it, believing it, trusting it, and it's actually by trusting in the hope of the gospel, reading the gospels over and over and over again, that releases faith and releases love in our lives. So back to verse 27. Christ in our midst is the hope of glory. Why? Because he's taking the sickness. He's taking the oppression. He's taking our struggles with sin. He's taking all of those things into himself and releasing healing for us. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. Now, let's go back to Mark 4. Or Mark 5 is where we were, and, and, and we'll finish. I didn't know if I'd teach, but I guess I'm teaching today, right? So let's, let's, let's finish it up. So Mark chapter 5. So they want him to lay hands on a little girl who's dying. But on the way, verse 24 of Mark 5. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather got worse. Now this isn't, Jesus isn't knocking doctors, all right? Do doctors are, are healers. But the, the healing that doctors can do, where, where their limits end, that's where Jesus' healing begins. And that's all they're saying here is, is go to doctors, be quarantined. Again, this is, this is part of you know, Jewish understanding, be quarantined, let the priest examine you and declare you're healed, and while you're quarantined, uh, you'll, you'll be at a distance from other people, and other people will not get the communicable illness. Go see doctors. There were doctors in the, in the uh, Gentile world. Go see doctors. If you can get well, praise God for it. But here's a woman who wasn't. She, she had this a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, remember, this is also something that the Jews would quarantine. 
There is quarantine for physical illness. There's quarantine for spiritual uncleanness. This woman was rendered unclean by this flow of blood. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Now here's the opposite side. Here's a woman who's not supposed to be touching anyone, touching Jesus. Jesus isn't supposed to touch certain people. He's touching it. It's all about this touch. And all she, she doesn't even want to touch his body. She just says, if I can get a hold of his garment, I'll be made well. So this woman, obviously, she was motivated by a word of faith. She had a word of faith that said, I, I know I'm going to get whole if I just press into Jesus. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, he, he sensed the healings in Jesus, and he felt the release of that power. Turned to the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, and she was fearing and trembling because she wasn't supposed to touch Jesus. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She declared her story. She told her story. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And this is, this is why I wanted to read Mark's version. Because Mark uses the word, your faith has made you well. Go in, in shalom, in the blessing of God, be healed of your affliction. She had that faith, Jesus made her well. Now again, our faith really does, Amen. it draws us toward Jesus. Faith is like a, like a, 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 a the, faith is, 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 is the metal in us that is drawn toward the magnet that's in Jesus. We need to keep that. We, we need to understand that. In this hour, we're not going to tell people, well, you're not having faith. That's why you're not healed. We're going to say, let your faith take you to Jesus. That's the point of this, this ministry of Jesus, the healing ministry. We're drawn to him. And our faith makes us well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Well, we don't want to stop there because we still have to find out about the little girl. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now, you could look at it this way and say, Well, you know, Jesus, because he stopped to heal that other woman. Well, then the other, the other healing that he was supposed to do, he lost it. As if doing the work of the Lord can cause us to lose out on the work of the Lord. It's not going to be that way. Jesus, Jesus, it's, it's, it's not an issue to him. He was sent by his father to heal that little girl because he was delayed healing this woman. doesn't change the fact that the Lord, the father, had sent him to heal that child. And we got to remember that whatever task God gives us, if we find other tasks on the way to fulfilling the task God gives us, it doesn't mean the task won't be fulfilled. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you that little story, because I, I know we want to get started in our service. I, uh, uh, my, my, uh, my, my uncle, my uncle Cecil, and my, my Aunt Betty. My Aunt Betty, um, she had gotten sick with brain cancer, and it was terminal. And she eventually did pass away from it. Uh, but um, uh, Mike Cassidy, my wife, and I went to pray for my aunt. And when we went to pray for her, they were saying, you know, it was a brain tumor. The tumor's too large. She probably doesn't even hear you. She probably won't understand you. You know, she was she was she would be what we would call today in, in hospice care. And we went there, and I, I, I went up there, and I began to speak to her. And I just shared with my aunt my testimony that I had found Jesus. And uh, uh, I just shared with her how I came to know Christ, how I asked Christ into my life, and I asked her if she wanted, if she wanted to ask Christ into her life. And tears started pouring from her. She was laying in the bed, 
tears started pouring in her eyes, and she just said, Michael, you're the best. And I knew she understood, even in this, this, this horrible state of uh, advanced brain tumor, she understood what I meant, and I prayed for her, and I led her to Christ. She passed away, and then at her funeral, I shared that story. I shared the story at the, I, I was actually, the, the nephews were the pallbearer, so we were all pallbearers. I mean, we were there in the mausoleum at the, at the church, and I just, at the cemetery, and I just said, I, I, I need to tell everybody this. And I shared the story about how my aunt came to the Lord, and I just closed my eyes, and so I started saying, praise the Lord, praise Jesus, praise the Lord. And all of a sudden, somebody comes running out and grabs me and hugs me and draws me to himself and says, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Well, it was my uncle's brother, who was a spirit-filled believer in Georgia, who had been, who couldn't get up to, couldn't get up to Michigan to, to pray with my aunt to make sure she had given her heart to Christ. And he said, I was praying, I was praying, I couldn't get up there. I couldn't get up there. It was, it was my uncle Cecil's brother, Doyle. And he said, thank you, son, thank you. You're the answer to our prayers. Praise God. All right, let's flash forward 20, 30 years. My uncle Cecil's in the hospital and died. See, my uncle Cecil was a was a was a believer who who had had kind of gotten away from following the Lord. And I needed to go and I said, I'm gonna go, I gotta go pray with my uncle Cecil. Just just like 30 years earlier with my Aunt Betty. I gotta I gotta go pray for him. But but something came up. I had a trip to Columbia that I had to do, a ministry trip, and I couldn't make it to the hospital to see him. So I said, you know what, I'll see him when I get back. I'll see him when I get back. And so so I, I was just praying, Lord, just, just be with my Uncle Cecil, and touch him and keep him strong and well until I return. Well, I flew to Columbia, and then I flew back and I'm in the airport in Miami, and I'm waiting uh, uh, to, to get my flight back home. And my wife calls me and says, your Uncle Cecil passed away. I went to Columbia on the work of the Lord. The Lord assigned me to go pray for my Uncle Cecil, and I screwed up. I missed it. I flew it. I was really, really upset. Flew home, went to my Uncle Cecil's, went to my Uncle Cecil's funeral, and I was standing there, and a young woman came up to me, and she said, you're, you're, you're a Mike, the Cecil's nephew, I mean, yes, yes. She said, well, my dad told me to tell you that he flew up, and this was Doyle, that he flew up, and your uncle got it right with Christ. The same guy that prayed for somebody to reach my aunt 30 years earlier, and I was the answer to his prayer, he became the answer to my prayer 30 years later. And the point is, is, is Things can get in the way. We've got a purpose for the Lord. We've got something we've got to do. We've got a task from the Lord. Something gets in our way, and it seems like we're, oh, I had to go to this other thing to he heal this woman with a flow of blood, and now the little girl that I was going to go to pray for died. Jesus, nothing stops God's purposes Amen. from being fulfilled. Amen. So Amen. Jesus, Jesus makes it. The little girl's dead. Don't trouble the master. And Jesus said, Verse 36, as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead. She's just sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. And then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, that's Aramaic, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. So the point here is, when we're on a mission from God, if one thing hinders us from fulfilling the mission and it gets delayed, it doesn't mean the 
purpose is going to be fulfilled. Yeah, right. Jesus yeah. went to heal a little girl and yeah. ended up raising her from the dead. Amen. God just gets greater glory. Amen. So, Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, Lord. We're going to get ready uh, for our service. And, Lord, we want to give you the glory. Yeah. Move powerfully and mightily and speak to us in our midst in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. God, amen. Now, we'll, we'll invite everybody in, uh, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to reverse things a little bit. We're going to open in prayer. I'll have to, let, let me go back and make sure everybody's uh, ready for this. I feel like we can put that aside. We're going to open in prayer. We're going to have the Lord's Supper, and then we're also going to have, um, uh, we'll take the collection, and then we're going to go right into the message, and then we're going to close with so we're going to do it a little different because we can't really, we're not really supposed to show the worship on the live stream because it could be copyright infringement. You know, we're singing songs from uh, other people. We might have to pay, pay certain amounts. But let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let me see if, if, if Louise is here to read the protocol. We want to, we want to still follow the protocols. We want to honor the the, the, the laws and just the, the, the advices that we're given. We're still here. Jesus is going to move mightily in our midst. But let me, uh, let's take a few minutes before we start the service. In other words, that's what I'm saying. Long story short, um, for those of you watching on the live cast, we're going to, we're going to stop right here and then we're going to pick up in about five more minutes. Is the live stream